The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone. Welcome to The Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of The Stoa. Um, and there might be some new faces here today uh, and new people might be watching and they might be wondering, what is the STOA? Uh, my first answer is who, who really cares? Um, that's not important. Uh, what's important that a lot of people think a lot of awesome stuff is happening here. And one of those awesome things is a SenseMaker in Residence series that we have at the STOA. And this is a series where someone comes in and joins us at the STOA for four mm -hmm. sessions over a month. Uh, to make sense of some aspect of the world and reality with us. And today we have Nina Power, um, probably uh, the human being who has the most awesome name in the world. Um, and uh, she's going to do a series called Men and Women, the Future of Love, Sex and Friendship. So each one of these series, we have an MC. Um, that's one of that's part of the Stoa community that uh, that runs the, the Q&A portion. And today we have the Blackbird, Raven Connolly. So I will take in Raven in a moment and Raven will introduce Nina and talk about the, the Q&A protocols. And we're here for 90 minutes uh, today in total. So that being said, I will take you in Raven. Thank you, Peter. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here to host Nina Power at the STOA. So for those of you who don't know, Nina Power is a cultural critic and philosopher, kind of post-academic of sorts, who's a writer um, and we just, uh, I, we just finished a course uh, with Justin Murphy on Bataille, which is how Nina Power and I met each other. And she's going to be discussing with us today, love. And I'm very excited for this. I think this is a topic that's usually on people's minds, but maybe even more so given our isolation um, due to lockdown, the pandemic. So with that, uh, we're going to do about, um, you know, just a little bit of discussion, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour, and we'll have a little bit of back and forth between Nina and I, and then we'll go into the Q&A with, with the group, and the protocol for that will be writing your question in, in the chat, and then I'll call on you, and you can ask your question to Nina. And with that, Nina, do you want to send us off? Sure. Um, well, thank you to Peter and to Raven for the invitation um, to do this four part course. And I was going to give a little bit of background to some of the work that I've been doing, which inspired the topics for the four weeks. So obviously under the aegis of men and women, the future of love, sex and friendship, um, I wanted to kind of go through these different aspects. So it's love this week, marriage, sex, and then men and women in week four. And the kind of research I've been doing the last couple of years has been um, for a book on men called What Do Men Want, which is coming out next year. And whilst I was kind of looking at all of these different aspects of masculinity and men's rights activism and incels and all of these kinds of um, things, um, it really struck me that one of the things that we all need to, well, we could all think a bit about more is the fact that we live in a very mixed world, like a heterosocial world. So not just a heterosexual world. Um, obviously not everyone is heterosexual. <laughs> That's the kind of dominant sexuality, but rather I was more interested in the fact that we live as men and women together all the time, every day in various kinds of interaction, most of which um, aren't uh, particularly sexual or filled with love or <laughs> uh, anything like that. Um, so I wanted to kind of think then about what that really means um, to live in this, in this kind of mixed way and also to think about aspects perhaps of the relationship between men and women like friendship that are kind of often overlooked or dismissed or rather diminished as something that's perhaps impossible. Um, and in that sense, I kind of wanted to, to think about um, a more positive and nuanced um, set of relationships between the sexes. Um, and that's the kind of uh, motivation for the, the book on men. So it's not at all a kind of polemic or a critique or a going along with these sorts of um, ideas of toxic masculinity or anything like that. It does discuss male violence and, and think uh, kind of unavoidably, um, <laughs> but it, in a sense, it's an attempt at a kind of reconciliation. So in the kind of contemporary context then to think about questions of love, 
Um, these are obviously very kind of ancient questions. You know, this love is a very ancient philosophical question, um, right the way back to the Greeks, of course. If we think about Plato and particular texts, the dialogue like Phaedrus um, and Symposium, Phaedrus is a, is a strange dialogue, uh, which is about um, seduction in some ways. It's about the relationship between political order and the kind of um, potentially disruptive qualities of love, but also about the possibilities of love as a kind of higher knowledge. Um, and many of you will also know the Symposium, which is perhaps is Plato's more famous dialogue on love in which people tell a series of stories at a drinking party. Um, and it's quite important that it's in this kind of particular environment, all of Plato's dialogues are set in particular locations, which are highly significant for the kind of topic that's on uh, hand. Um, so the drinking party therefore is a good place to discuss love, um, which includes kind of sexual desire, includes kind of uh, the question of higher knowledge, whether love can actually um, allow us to see the universe differently, which is an idea that's also taken up later on by people like Alain Badiou, uh, in particular, the idea of love as a kind of, uh, you know, Badiou is this French philosopher, he's still alive. Um, love for him is something that produces truth, that in the encounter we are potentially in relation to another kind of knowledge or a way of knowledge being opened up. Um, he talks about love kind of giving us the universe. Um, and perhaps in this experience of love, we might have this different way of seeing things. It changes our um, perspective. Um, other philosophers, of course, are, are less uh, kindly disposed uh, to love. Uh, we should note also the kind of pessimistic thought of somebody like Schopenhauer. <laughs> who is um, singularly unimpressed with, uh, with, with love <laughs> um, and also about the possibilities of relations between men and women. Um, in that sense, something like six, sex would be perceived as a kind of trick, a kind of trick played by nature. Uh, for example, Nietzsche sarcastically notes that most philosophers don't get married in the genealogy of morality. He suggests that philosophers are basically primarily concerned with uh, keeping enough time and space for their own uh, meandering wanderings rather than actually engaging in any form of uh, practical arrangement with another human being, um, which may or may not have some truth to it. Uh, and philosophers might seek to dignify this, he suggests, um, by proclaiming that their way of life is the most moral, like the contemplative life is the best form, uh, whereas perhaps Nietzsche suggests it might just be an excuse um, not to have to um, deal with <laughs> the very Uh, way we tend to mean something like a kind of fusion of erotic love that is to say sexual love with perhaps either a monogamous image of being with somebody so some somewhere between an, an eros and a contract um, and can for example will make a joke about saying you know the because because we can't treat um, each other as an end uh, in marriage that in a way the marriage contract is where the only time we kind of sign over our genitals for the use of somebody else uh, and this is what marriage is it's an incredibly unromantic way of understanding what marriage is but it but it avoids Kant um you know for, it, it avoids being immoral uh, for Kant because we're not allowed to treat people as means to an end and obviously sex threatens to um disrupt that idea because of course if we're seeking pleasure from somebody else we're perhaps treating them in a tool-like way so the marriage contract for Kant is at least a formal admission that we are using someone uh, for, for another end um, <laughs> but we might want to uh, defend you know uh, either in a platonic or a Badiouian way or from the on the basis of our own experience the significance of love not reduce it to merely uh, something like a chemical process or a symptom of nature's trick in the Schopenhauerian sense or as a you know something merely uh, pragmatic uh, and formal um, and instead kind of think of it as you know, potential avenue uh, into knowledge, which would be the Plato-Badiou line. Um, but just to kind of 
a, a bit of terminological um, background, I think it would be very interesting just to present some of the Greek, the other Greek words for different kinds of love, um, just to make it obvious in a way that the way we think about love today, what I'm calling this fusion of, I don't know, like eros and contract, is um, really very specific. It's a very narrow notion of love. And of course, we all experience different kinds of love in our life, you know, familial love, the love between friends, um, you know, the love of ideas, there are many other forms of love. But so I'm just going to kind of run through this sort of list of, of love. And, and it might be interesting for people to reflect on where they see these um, in their own lives, I think. Um, so I'm going to mention eight different kinds. So the first is philia, which is a kind of, you know, love or uh, almost like a brotherly love. It could be a love of, of friends. It could be a love of, um, you know, those who are close to us, but not in a, a kind of um, sexual uh, way. Um, we might ask what's happened to something like civic friendship, which is a crucial idea for Aristotle and others. The idea that um, when we take care of each other, we're also taking care of the city or the place where we live or the community, um, such that there's a kind of shared love that has another kind of end in mind. So for example, if somebody was behaving in a destructive manner, whether it's self-destructive or outwardly destructive, there would be kind of an additional reason, i.e. the preservation of the community or the city for helping that person to, to stop behaving in such a way, whether they were suffering addiction or whether they were, you know, mentally unwell, it wouldn't simply be a question of rescuing the individual, but rather seeing them as part of a kind of whole civic community. Um, and we can ask perhaps what's happened to this idea of brotherly love. It doesn't, it's not only a, a man thing. Of course, we can talk about sisterly love or love of each other as, as, as human beings. Um, and I think often friendship is, yeah, it's a very complicated question today in the era of virtual friends, you know, friends on Facebook, so supposedly, you know, the, those kind of social bonds and social ties are, are both kind of virtualized and to some extent weakened. And I think in recent years, we've seen a lot of people um, breaking ties and breaking friendships often over quite minor political disagreements, which is something that really um, strikes me often as, as something that's very sad, actually, that, that friendship doesn't seem to have much of a purchase if people sort of disagree with each other. You know, I mean, we might still be friends with a very small number of people, but once that idea of friendship is kind of diluted into these virtual deracinated communities, if, if, we, if we can even call them that, um, we can ask, you know, what does friendship mean? What is our kind of relation to um, each other? Um, then there's Eros, of course, I've already mentioned, primarily a kind of sexual love, but not only, you know, we can think about the difference between erotics and pornography or erotica or pornography. Eros also seems to have another spiritual dimension, although for Plato and others, if Eros is kind of separated from an image of the good or an image of knowledge, it can uh, serve to distract us. So this is why Plato is quite suspicious in a way of beauty for its own sake, or if one adores someone simply because of how they look, their attractiveness, um, you know, the, and, and even Plato's um, criticism of poets and poetry um, in the Republic, very famously, he suggests that poetry is a problem because it's seductive um, and it can present kind of false ideas or appearances that it, that it remains stuck at the level of a kind of, um, yeah, a, a kind of beautiful luck potential lie, you know, or seductive um, way of being. Um, and so for the Greeks, eros is, is kind of very important, but it, if it's just that, um, then it potentially serves to kind of disrupt things like the social order um, and doesn't permit kind of higher philosophical thought, um, we could say. Um, and undoubtedly, uh, we live in a very, you know, eroticized age or a, you know, pornographic age in many ways in which the kind of visual is extremely dominant, you know, the question of people's attractiveness, you know, of, often kind of um, preempts almost any other sort of understanding we might we might have of another person. 
Um, and it's the kind of love that's sort of celebrated how, you know, above all others in certain ways, um, you know, which, which is rather narrow as I've suggested already. Um, the Greeks also had an idea of pragma as a kind of love. And this, where we get, this is where we get the word for pragmatism. So obviously a kind of practical love, which I find very interesting. I'm very um, keen on this kind of love in a way. I think of my parents who've been married for 50 years since they were 23, and they're both um, extremely practical people. And they, they kind of approach their marriage almost in the spirit of a kind of practical project. Um, and they sort of work at it and they do things together and they're very sort of um, interested in, in, you know, uh, almost being like pioneers and and very kind of jaunty about it and I kind of I, I often reflect on their you know their love as being a kind of pragmatism I mean they still you know love and admire each other and, and have you know find each other attractive even 50 years later but it, it doesn't seem to me to necessarily be the basis of their love I think something like pragmatism or pragma as a form of love um, is perhaps a kind of love that's more long lasting, potentially, that it has this kind of, you know, solidity and this kind of, you know, an understanding that, um, you know, it, love is also work, not necessarily exploitative <laughs> labour, but hopefully not, but rather something that is a kind of project. Um, and I think even when you look at philosophers like Badiou, who are trying, who are trying to kind of keep the um, philosophical valuation of love as sort of central to their project. Um, for Badiou, it's still going to be a question of um, how you um, stay faithful, not necessarily sexually faithful, but faithful to the encounter that kind of triggered love, right? This is not a kind of definition of love as something that's simply flighty or sexual or I mean, could be short-lived, but but actually what's interesting about love in the encounter for Badiou and also love in Plato as a kind of potential route for philosophical reflection is that it requires something like a kind of pragmatism as well, it seems to me, like there has to be a kind of commitment um, involved. Um, of course, this doesn't necessarily have to be uh, marriage, but kind of marriage would be the most obvious way in which love can be or could be kind of recognized and understood as a kind of um, practical um, uh, project, if you like. And yeah, so I think there's something there that we I think is very interesting to talk about, like what the kind of practical dimensions of love um, could be. Um, and pragma would also go for kind of, if you were in a partnership with somebody, if you were working on a project together, you know, you could have a great love for your friend who you're also kind of working on an intellectual project with, um, for example. And I think it's kind of important to note that. Um, there's also storge or storg, which is a kind of idea of a familial love, a kind of love that we, we almost sort of, um, you know, um, inherit. You know, there are people that we perhaps maybe feel compelled or feel like we must love not that everybody stays in touch with their family by any means and some people's families you know are not uh, necessarily held together by love in many ways but the, for the Greeks to kind of identify almost like the the love of duty basically a kind of dutiful love um, and it's interesting whether we feel we have ties or bonds or responsibility to our family, even when we might be prefer to do something else. Um, you know, what's the kind of moral dimension of love, if you like? You know, what do we kind of, what must we do for those that we love, even if um, they, we find them very difficult, or we find that kind of behavior very difficult. Um, philautia, they talk about, is a kind of uh, idea of self-love. Perhaps what does it mean to almost take care of yourself? Um, it goes back a, bit, a little bit to the civic friendship idea I was talking about in Aristotle, like if somebody is behaving in a way that is kind of self-destructive or harming themselves, this has implications if you live in a kind of community way for the community as a whole, because it reflects, you know, in a way about what's happening to everyone and, and to the city, if you like, in the Greek model. So for the Greeks, 
loving oneself in a way is also a kind of important dimension. Of course, this might become rather pathological. You know, we also live in a culture that very much wants to kind of, um, I don't know, like encourage a kind of consumerist self-love, the idea that, you know, of like treating yourself or, um, you know, self-care as a kind of like, I don't know, a capitalist um, activity in a way. Um, and I think there's an ob obvious sense in which that can become something like uh, narcissism. You know, you can ask with Christopher Lash and others whether we live in a culture of narcissism that kind of celebrates and rewards um, individual pathological sort of self-celebration. Um, I think it's, you know, quite complicated, but there's no doubt in which there's certain rewards for, um, let's say, um, you know, an overestimation or overpromotion, self-promotion. The very idea of the self is a very contemporary um, image, it's a very modern notion. The idea of a self separated from a community or a family, you know, the idea of individuality is kind of highly encouraged by sort of advanced liberal modern societies, um, but it's a relatively new historical um, development. And I think some of the, you know, pathologies of the self you know, are really a symptom of, of that. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's in kind of consumer capital's interest that people think of themselves as, as brands or selves that need to be kind of constantly updated um, and so on. Um, but the sad, you know, there's obviously a kind of sad dimension to this, which would be, you know, the, the over atomization, the kind of loneliness and the kind of over individuation of people, you know, perhaps, who no longer feel part of a community or feel very isolated in different ways. Um, and if you read kind of Ovid and you read the original myths of, around narcissism, you know, this is tragic, right? This is not something to be um, emulated. You know, Narcissus is one of the most tragic um, figures in myth. You know, he's unable to understand that people that there is anyone else around him. You know, he's surrounded by young men and women who want to hang out with him because he's so beautiful. Um, he can't hear echo, where we get the word for echo from because he can't hear her. He's simply staring into the water, into his reflection, which he thinks is somebody else, doesn't realize that it's him. And he kind of withers away and dies and all of his beauty is lost. You know, all of his possibility of engaging with the world and with other people, with nature and with, you know, anyone else is completely gone. So when we talk about people perhaps being overly narcissistic, you know, I think it's important to recognize just how tragic that is, that it's not something um, <laughs> to be envious of in any, in any way at all. Like the narcissist is somebody who cannot um, respect or appreciate the, the life of others in a way, you know, who is closed off from various forms of interaction, including, you know, any form of kind of, um, you know, beautiful or, or engaging love. Um, that is to say, you know, the narcissist can't necessarily, you know, uh, be loved in any um, genuine um, sense. Um, ludus is an interesting one for the Greeks, and this is to do with play. So where we get the idea for um, Ludo, the game, but ludic would be the kind of adjectival form. So where we are kind of, um, you know, if this could be thought of as something like flirting, um, it's a kind of like, uh, you know, like a sort of game, the game playing love, but also the love of children, like the children when they're playing games. So not again, not necessarily part of seduction. It's a very interesting book by Jean Baudrillard called Seduction, um, in which he kind of talks about the relationship between men and women as a kind of game playing um, scenario. Um, and yeah, there's something very nice about this idea, I think, of love as a kind of game playing. And I think um, we have kind of debased versions of that perhaps in con contemporary life when if you think about things like pickup artists and this idea of that date picking up women is a game. <laughs> You know, this is a very narrow idea of like playing a particular kind of game. And Neil Strauss writes this famous book quite a long time ago now called The Game, um, where he describes all of the different kind of pickup techniques. Um, th this idea of pickup artistry, I think, has been like massively superseded in the era of um, dating apps and so on. But there's still a kind of strategic, gamified, perhaps approach to 
dating, which kind of dominates, which maybe isn't quite the sort of lighthearted, playful um, idea that we could, you know, alternatively contemplate, although they might have something uh, in common. Um, okay, and then agape, um, which is a kind of perhaps more spiritual uh, sort of love, a kind of unconditional love, the highest form of love, perhaps in some ways. It's also taken up by Christianity um, in the idea of the, the kind of love of God um, for man and by man. Um, it's a kind of um, absolutely expansive love. It, you could think of it also in terms of like a love of humanity, uh, a love of everything um, that is that kind of, you, you know, euphoric, elevated, um, open love uh, in a way, our unconditional love. Um, again, sort of not something we perhaps encounter very often. Um, we might have this experience when we're outside in nature sometimes or, you know, when we're feeling particularly um, elevated, but it's not necessarily something that's kind of um, celebrated particularly um, often, we could say, outside of kind of perhaps religious communities in some ways. Um, and the final kind of love I just want to mention of the Greek terms is this idea of, of xenia, which is um, X-E-N-I-A. Um, and if you think of the words for um, sort of xenophilia or xenophobia, you can probably imagine what the word is. And it's to do with the kind of love of the stranger. Um, so this idea of like welcoming people you don't know, let's say loving people that you, you don't, you've never met before, or that you're welcoming into your homes. And this is very important in Homer, this idea of um, being a good host, almost, you could say. Um, we can think about this today in relation to the question of refugees, for example. Um, what does it mean to kind of um, welcome the stranger or the person from another place? You know, it's a particular kind of um, love. Um, Okay, so I'm going to leave the opening discussion now and can see some kind of questions. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, so that, sorry, the, the loving oneself, um, yeah, is philautia. So it's it's like auto love. Um, I think you can see the etymo etymology there. Yeah, I, I haven't um, typed in the, the words, but I can quickly um, type them um, here so you can get a sense of. Yeah, you can go ahead and do that. Um... Yeah. So uh, yeah, if, when people have questions, just go ahead and throw them into the chat. And if you put question at the beginning, that helps me kind of identify that you have a question. Um, and then, yeah, I'll call on your name and you can ask Nina your question and have one back and forth with her. Um, Nina, I did want to ask a question to you though, before we move over to the group, which is, so you would imagine that these forms of love are still persistent, right? That there's still aspects of like being in community, being human, um, that they don't don't just go away because we don't have common words for them in our mm -hmm. contemporary society. So to so to me, and it's also interesting because you bring up the words in order to kind of illustrate these aspects of what it is to be in relationship to others um, on many levels yeah. of interaction within the context of love. Uh, so what is it to have words? that illustrate and kind of divide these qualities of, of relationality in our experiences. And then on the other side, kind of the negation, what is it to have an absence of these words? Uh, what is the effect of that in, in, in the person, in the person's psychology? Do we confuse love? Do we confuse one kind of love for another? Do we not know how to become mature in our different aspects of love in, in society because we don't understand love to be differentiated. So do you have any uh, insight into that? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think one of the, you know, interesting things about, I don't know, you don't, you don't even have to call it philosophy, but almost philology or etymology, you know, when we look at the origins of words and we look at how they kind of develop and their genesis and you know, even before we might think of them as concepts, before we even argue about what they might mean or how we can have a kind of philosophical definition, um, is simply the, the way, yeah, I think is implicit in your question. You know, if we don't have a word to describe something, <laughs> you know, or if we used to have words to describe something, and by we, I mean in the kind of loosest possible sense, you know, do, do we lose something um, in that kind of um, 
you know, missing out or dropping those words. And I think you're right that those, just take those eight Greek words, you know, they definitely, as you say, correspond to um, onwardly existing ideas. Um, we might have lost ideas like civic friendship, I think. I think we no longer love each other because we love the city or vice versa. I think those are things that have become kind of crushed through the process of modernization and globalization, you know, that we don't have those sorts of um, love of a small community, perhaps, unless we're living in a very specific kind of way. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think, you know, to even understand something like a practical approach to life as, as a kind of love, I think is a very, just very mind opening kind of thing to do. And that to even question, when we talk about love and we maybe implicitly all have an idea of what that means and if it means something like you know this kind of combination of um eros you know sexual love and you know perhaps a bit of monogamy or the contract you know that that's again just a, such a narrow version and yet if we're kind of being endlessly told that that's what we want or we feel that that's what we want or need you know then we've kind of you know created a very limited horizon for thinking about all of the different kinds of love that might exist or that you know that are around and and i think rather suspiciously we might have to wonder why a culture might encourage you know particular modalities of desire and love rather than celebrate and recognize others yeah so my other question is there seems to be an interesting theme here um between like love being connected to truth which seems to me to be connected to kind of purity maybe you would think of it um as like gold or something like that something that's untarnished something that is itself that's properties are self-evident um something kind of in a positive way that is seen can be seen and can be known and then there's also this theme that comes up with the things that you were saying about plato and some other and schopenhauer of this kind of quality to mm -hmm. love uh, and maybe we would say that that turns into an understanding of like the lie you know that which like appears one way but is really another way and then that even maybe moving forward into a concept of like hate or evil in the kind of dichotomy between love and evil and it's interesting because you know I think if we demoralize those two things, they seem to be different aspects of what love is or what it is to be in relation to someone. Um, and that in some cases, this side of duplicitousness or like the kind of double meaning of poetry, of, of like being in interaction or in um, courtship with a woman, for example, that there's all of these kinds of double meanings or open-ended games that don't have clear kind of def definite uh, truth kind of uh, in a positive way. So like, what is, what's going on there? The how like love has get, be, become entangled with all of these other dichotomies and could that be part of how we've, kind of evolved an impoverished sense of love through the Western kind of development of, of these concepts. Yeah, I mean, on the, on the question of hate, I want to say something about that briefly first. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, if you, if you look at Freud, I mean, Freud says that love and hate are not opposites, right? They're not kind of pairs in any meaningful sense. And he says that actually hate comes first. And by hate, he means kind of the rejection of something outside of you. Um, you know, so that in a way, hate is a necessary development, right? In the kind of infant's being, which is to say to refuse something um, simply. Um, we might say that in a way, hate comes first developmentally, perhaps that love is a more kind of advanced um, feeling, although maybe we're kind of in a kind of um, fusion in the first place. And for Badu and, and Plato, the question of fusion is a dangerous one. Like love is not to be understood as a kind of, um, you know, merging with somebody else simply. I mean, you have that proposed in the symposium in Aristophanes story, which is the most famous one of the symposium that, that we're part of a whole and that we've been broken off um, and that we, we're always looking for our you know, other half, which is still a phrase that people use today. 
Um, but that sort of presupposes love as a kind of organic fusion whole that we're we're complete in the other, um, which is still a kind of dominant narrative. You know, I mean, Badu talks about the Hollywood idea of like you know the the romance, the you know the idea of like the one and these kind of things, which are sort of almost theological <laughs> in their um, idea. It was also, I mean, it's also perpetuated in like Sex and the City and like various kind of you know, the idea that you find your perfect partner and, and that would complete you. Um, so it's a very old idea. It's a very old story, if you like. And it's Aristophanes' story is this very, um, it's a very funny, very beautiful, very literary idea that we were once part of holes and then we were split apart and then we wander the earth looking for the other half and then in order to become literally balls, like round balls so that we can travel better. Um, it's very funny, but so, I think the idea of, like you said, purity um, can't be, I think, philosophically, um, one of a kind of um, overcoming of difference in a way that I think love that preserves sexual difference, you know, whether we're talking about same sex partnerships or heterosexual relationship, you know, it's not about the erosion of difference or about the erosion of each other's character, even if you become, you know, a bit like you're the person you're with. It's, it's that love, you know, Badu would say, turns you outwards, it turns you back to the world. It doesn't create this inward looking, staring into each other's eyes. I mean, that's, that's a kind of infatuation or mesmerism or something like this. You know, it, if, you, if you want to think about love philosophically or as a form of knowledge or even like a method of knowing the world, then it, it kind of has to be like outward looking. Um, if you like, and not about um, a kind of uh, oblivion or mesmerism. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, there was probably some other aspects to your question. I, yeah, sorry. I guess it's just yeah. like, there's just this theme, it seems to be, and like almost like I may also kind of run through this tendency for philosophers to not be in like long term or kind of focused on courtship and their worlds at all like if you're interested in that which can be made evident to you and especially like pinning things down with language like if that's the kind of like love that you're most interested in then there's almost like a tension between the kind of love that I think you engage in when you're dealing with courtship because you have to kind of submit to this unknown process where there's all these signals coming to you that you can't be sure are are true or accurate and we see you know we see this in stories like women are represented as these like you know you have like the femme fatale for example who like you know leads the kind of protagonist into these dark places and you know he's mesmerized by her but she's not really what she appears to be so there's these like um there's these traps in love I think and especially mes being mesmerized by like the kind of female seductive you mentioned seduction earlier, like being suspicious of seduction um, mm -hmm. as being this quality that's that's brought through in literature, art, um, as men, I think, kind of deal with the ambiguity of relation with, with women. Um, and I, I guess that's kind of like part of the question to me or, or what I'm kind of working on is it seems that's been moralized, like, this kind of this aspect of things not being as they are um, mm -hmm. and yeah. that not being something to, that love is but in fact that's like lying or that's like yeah evil no, I, I, I totally understand what you're saying now yeah sure that, that actually that that the certain images of yeah seduction or courtship um threaten the the kind of the you know the pure philosophical idea of like the quest for knowledge or truth or something like that oh absolutely undoubtedly I think that you could you can criticize Plato very seriously for being like very um prudish almost <laughs> you know he basically says that you know erotic love if you just get stuck in the beauty of the other that you're just not a very good philosopher I mean he, he has a go at Alcibiades in the symposium for this you know like what are you doing why are you trying to hit on me you know, it's like he refuses the kind of um, the approach in that way. Yeah, like Amy is saying, seduction means to lead away from. 
Yeah, and I, I, it's very interesting then, to, if you read Baudrillard's book on seduction, in a way it's exactly what you're talking about, Raven. He's basically defending um, seduction against these kind of, um, you know, we could say like, I don't know, mainstream um, goody two-shoes um, philosophers. Um, <laughs> and he's also kind of criticizing the idea, for example, of that we understand what power is. He says that, you know, he says, for example, women have never lacked power. He says this idea that uh, women are always the victims of patriarchy and hierarchy and so on um, is just uh, untrue. That that women's power just lies in the symbolic, you know, not in the not in the uh, realm of the representational. But if we're always looking for um, evidence of you know foundation and structure and and you know purity, as you say, or um, yeah, a, a kind of access to the transcendent. Uh, via the process of love, we could very well, we are indeed neglecting um, precisely the, maybe the ludic or the seductive, the game playing aspects. It's very interesting if you look at courtly love, um, you know, in the, in the kind of Middle Ages, and Lacan talks about courtly love as well, you know, this idea of, in a way, of like love at a distance, you know, as a kind of entire, um, you know, genre of being and thinking and, and thinking literarily, um, yeah, how do we kind of uh, come to understand, um, you know, that if if what we're focused on is kind of love as a, you know, I don't know, a purifying process, you know, it's it, it's it's entirely motivating um, to love somebody at a distance, perhaps, you know, um, and and maybe also more allure, alluring than having to deal with the reality of other human beings and I, I mean when Nietzsche makes his joke about philosophers I mean he's not inaccurate I mean virtually all of the famous male philosophers don't get married and they don't have children um you know and he says look Socrates is the, the only one and he does it ironically because Socrates is always moaning about how much his wife is a massive nag and he's really annoyed about her and this is why he'd rather uh hang out with the young men and, and chat about ideas dangerously than be at home with with his wife so <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, you could say there's there might be something inherent to the the act of thinking, or you know, the desire for a certain purity of thought, which absolutely mitigates against this the realm of um, seduction and playfulness that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think something that's very interesting is I think about some of the greats of like the 20th century in terms of philosophers, like Marshall McLuhan, for example, he was married, he had children, so did Rene Girard, right? So it, it, it feels like maybe there, we've been in this, this like era or this time where like this kind of, uh, this type of love of like being able to pin things down and measure things and make things extremely explicit as the philosophical project has been emphasized, but that potentially, I mean, kind of McLuhan's work would suggest we're moving into an era where like the kind of communication that we use is actually much more of the seductive kind. It's much more of yeah. like one thing being in one way, but really meaning something else. And so with that, actually the, the act of being in courtship with another person and being in this relational world where things are not as they seem, where things are moving in terms of paradox, like this idea of desire that you're bringing up, like you know, desire for the other draws you to them. It makes you postpone your anxiety and fear and irrationally you move towards something that you don't know that you can attain. But as you move closer to it, you kind of smother your, your, your erotic desire with your need for security to hold on to it. And so then it's like everything is changing into something else as you move. And that actually might be more of the ontological intuition that we need in order to survive in this world where things are not as they seem. Um, and maybe that's why we should be thinking philosophically about this more pathic or like libidinal process of, of engaging with the world philosophically, um, rather than this kind of asc like asceticism uh, that's like not interested in, 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 you know, love or sex or whatever. But anyways, we can follow through with that on another. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, what comes to mind is, um, amongst other things, is like, you know, the idea again, Baudrillard, the ecstasy of communication, 
you know that actually the the kind of libidinal <laughs> flows of like this highly mediated relational world is in a way where kind of desire is you know like that that's the world in which we live in that this idea of a you know being able to step back i mean i think this will come back when we talk about marriage in the future weeks but i think this idea of whether these modes you know at which at certain points look like i don't know um bourgeois norms or like restrictive forms of kind of uh, quasi property ownership you know in other periods start to look rather transgressive or abnormal you know and and therefore and, and unusual um and you know even something like the family when you read marx you know the family is a complicated place it's a place that is a relative um you know potential um sanctified realm a, a place of safety safety outside of work and the world you know but it's also a place of of kind of tradition and superstition all of which are being dissolved by modernity you know and in better or worse ways all of those kind of traditional ties you know all that solid melts into air i mean the the, the communist manifesto makes this very clear that there's these various forms of these dissolution of these old traditions and you know we know that kind of marriage is at an all-time low for example in the uk you know 50 percent of marriages end in divorce people are get are older when they, if if they do get married they're like in their late 30s um typically now in the uk and i'm sure that pattern is same in in other kind of western countries and um there's a sense in which though like i think one needs to be always critically on your guard it's like if if the culture is presenting to you these ideas of like oh well you can have a different partner every week just sign up to these apps and you know everything is fleeting and temporary and you know you can present yourself however you want in your descriptions and you know that there is also something kind of um you know potentially suspect about that too you know why is this culture then encouraging um these modes of behavior rather than what the culture might be might have been encouraging before which was to get married settle down have children you know and there's the, there is a lot of kind of discussion about these shifting demographic you know tendencies and i don't i you know it doesn't you don't need to be kind of necessarily right or left winged i think to have a particular position on these things although they do kind of play out politically more or less you know i think there used to be more of a left opposition to the normative idea of you know heterosexual family life let's say you know and now there's probably more of a uh i don't know almost a, a dissident right um <laughs> kind of uh, worry um i think that's kind of maybe more relevant in some ways about what marriage might mean and and actually um against this kind of quite dissolute culture in some ways so i, I mean I, I appreciate you're talking about a kind of this level of mediation and communication and um and playfulness but how i mean i suppose the question back to you would be something like you know given the commodification of all of these sorts of things in the in the in the networks you know how how is it possible to kind of exempt oneself you know how does one do it you know is it maybe better just to pick someone <laughs> settle down get married and do some and then spend the rest of your time thinking about other things rather than chasing endless seductive quests you know i know i mean of course these are going to be personal preferences right i mean this is also part of the question it's all it's a matter of choice to some extent i mean some people you know desire is also unfair as i endlessly repeat you know like it's not that everyone can play the same games all the time you know, for some people, it's much harder than others, even if they might want to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Peter, looks like you have a question. Do you want to ask it? Sure. Thank you, Raven. Um, yeah, so I interviewed this guy uh, called Sam Vaknin uh, a while ago. I don't know if you, you're familiar with him, but he's a narcissist who's an expert on narcissism. So he gets his narcissistic supply from his expertise on narcissism. <laughs> so it's like it's like a total recursive like trip there. Uh, and it was pretty trippy talking to him. And when we spoke, he's, his, his theory is that the religion of tomorrow is going to be the religion of narcissism. 
and he described it as like a pack of wolves, like narcissistic wolves, like roaming the internet using each other to get their narcissistic supply. Um, and he also framed it as like an ecumenical religion. So like, it doesn't matter what philosophy or political stance that you have, you can be narcissistic and get your narcissistic supply from, from that. So like using that as a premise and, and pausing that, that for a moment, uh, you mentioned Neil Strauss uh, and, and his follow-up book, The Truth, which wrote yeah. like 10 years afterwards, was really good, um, where he tried to like cultivate a harem and he failed and he, then he went into like monogamy. Uh, there was one scene, I don't know if you recall it, he was at like a conference of pickup artists and he says, who here has narcissistic mothers? And they all like put up their hand, um, like the, the all kind of Sunni mother kind of archetype. So at the edge of my thinking, the argument that I have in my head is that people on the left have daddy issues and then people on the right have mommy issues. Um, and I'm curious if you, what do you have thoughts on that? And I'm also curious if you have thoughts on what the male and female manifestation of narcissism, both our elders and our peers have influenced our maladaptive ways to seek love. Wow, okay, there's a lot going on there. What was your theory about left and right narcissism? So that, that, that people on the left have narcissistic that, fathers? Uh, uh, people on the left have daddy issues oh, and daddy people issues. on the right have mommy issues and then relatedly like how does like you know narcissistic elders with male or females influence our maladaptive uh, approaches to love mm. <laughs> right uh yeah that's it's a very interesting set of, set of questions um yeah interesting i i don't know i mean it, you know i i used to be kind of more actively involved in the london left and I mean, I, I would say like what became more and more apparent was a kind of great deal of, of, of misogyny among <laughs> men on the left, especially those who would say they were feminists, you know, it's classic, never trust a male feminist. But um, I think this is kind of also something that to take into consideration. I think there's a kind of um, lip service often paid to kind of equality and female emancipation. Um, but then the moment women disagree with you that, or, you know, they're not on side, um, then they, you kind of ignore them. And I, I, in that sense, I almost prefer a kind of more explicit right wing sexism in which men and women are seen as different beings and, you know, maybe even in stereotypical ways and that men and women have different roles. Um, because at least it's honest, because I think there's a kind of dishonesty <laughs> among some men on the left about what women are for. You know, I think women are just there maybe to supply, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, maybe not narcissistic supply, but certainly in the case of some people. But, um, you know, to to back up what the man thinks, you know, and that to be on side, you know, and that's what equality means for these men. It doesn't mean women are equal political players, you know. So, I mean, that's just a personal <laughs> anecdotal reflection but um yeah i i think that fear of the kind of um yeah the the mummy the all-consuming mother i mean yeah it's 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 interesting if we think about like don juan syndrome or you know where men are kind of endlessly trying to kind of enumerate i mean the game in a way and pick, pick up artistry does seem to be based around this um collecting model like everything has a number like she's a seven you know i've slept with 48 women whatever you know it's a kind of quantitative numeric project in some ways and and of course later on people um involved in that um and strauss does as well obviously recognize the huge limitations of this i mean even the idea of using particular strategies to pick up people and then if you have maybe a an actual relationship with them do you kind of come clean and go well yeah okay I was using these things I mean you know that it causes a bit of a problem if you've used a kind of you know trick or a technique <laughs> to pull someone but then but then you want them to know the real you I mean I think there's a very interesting case like in Rouge V who's like you know one of the biggest pickup artists who kind of um you know maybe like a year ago sort of suddenly converted to I think it's like Armenian apostolic Christianity uh, orthodox Christianity and suddenly became very um, moralistic you know and banned people from talking about sex in particular ways on his forum whereas you know he was previously publishing books saying like you know how to bang Latvian chicks and like he did this kind of thing where he went around the world and he did like pick up guides you know like he was really you know a big kind of player right that was his whole thing and it was quite of gross you know and but then he suddenly become kind of very religious you know and you wonder about that kind of switch you know the to, from a kind of 
yeah, like, I don't know, consumerist quantitative model of regarding people as simply, you know, notches on your bedpost to then having this more spiritual relation to your own life and to other people, you know, what that might be like. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you're, you're approach a, yeah, go on. Can I sneak a, a follow-up? Um, so what came to mind there was uh, this 1970 movie, Casanova, I think. And at the end, Casanova was dancing with like a, a, a life-size doll of a female and his mother was watching from the balcony. <laughs> so it's, that's kind of like, it encapsulates the whole kind of pickup artist scene right there, in my opinion, where you're afraid of this kind of like, the maybe the manipulative or, or side of the, the feminine and you want to control it completely and turn females into dolls that you can use. Mm -hmm. um, and... And I think that some of that maps over to all of the political or romantic tribes that are going on as well. Um, so that kind of like movement or algorithm, algorithm is true. You've got this like all-consuming narcissistic mother, and then there's like a response to it to control women. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, what is the, the, the feminine version of that, uh, if there is one? With a narcissistic um, father and, you know. Um, right. Yeah. Um I don't know. I mean, you mentioned like daddy issues. I mean, I guess there's been some sort of discussion in recent years about even using that word, like daddy, um, you know, like using it in a kind of sexual way. <laughs> um, it, you know, that maybe there's some kind of question there, like in sort of BDSM community, you know, that kind of movement from thinking about daddy as a sort of paternal figure to something like, um, um, yeah, I don't know, something kind of sex, sex, sexualized and someone who's in control. I mean, the, I mean, the, there are deeper questions here, I suppose, that cross across, uh, go across the sexes, which is to do with sadism and masochism or, you know, whether or, or kind of dominance and submission, really. You know, I mean, the, the idea of like somebody wanting to be dominated is also someone who's in control, right? It may not look like they're in control, but that's kind of precisely the point. It's like, if you read Venus in Furs and you look at the Deleuze essay on coldness and cruelty, which is extremely interesting on this topic of masochism and sadism, you know, they talk about the masochist as the one who's in control because the masochist is the one who writes the contract, who basically gets the sadist to agree to do what he or she wants. You know, so even though the masochist looks like the person who's kind of, um, you know, suffering domination, as it were, or being hurt, it's it's completely in that in that sense on their terms. You know, and we're not we're not talking about abuse here. We're talking about contractual situations such as the one outlined in Venus and Furs. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Whereas, yeah, I don't know. Let's think about the idea of a kind of, I don't know, I mean, are you kind of asking about sort of feminine strategies then that would relate to? Yeah, so I, I articulated what I think is true, a movement that's happening with men um, that I have more intimacy with and awareness of by being a man and seeing my other male friends do similar moves. Um, I'm wondering what the, the female equivalent is, if there is one. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know, just like, it's it's obvious, and I th I think some of what kind of men's rights activists say um, isn't wrong, right? In a certain sense, like I think it's definitely the case that women are basically in charge of selecting male partners. I think it's ultimately women who generally make the decision, and that does give women a particular power. That men's rights activists tend to see this as kind of like something um, unfair, right? They see this as a kind of injustice that women always, in a sense, get more sex than men do, right? Because women can ch afford to be more picky and you don't have to be a kind of behavioral or evolutionary psychologist to, to understand this, right? That, that, you know, that if you're a, you know, averagely good looking woman, it, you generally have more power in the dating market than men do, right? I, I, know, I mean, maybe that's controversial, but I think yes, someone Hannah's written. I think the traditional women's game is tricking men into marriage. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I, I think that probably um, quite a lot of women do seek stability, um, ultimately, and that um, you know this idea of the shit test, for example, the idea that women are constant, you know, testing men almost by kind of aggravating them or pushing them to see what they would do in order to protect the woman 
is a way of kind of preemptively checking them out for a more stable relationship. Um, I mean, it, you know, this stuff gets pretty grim in the analysis. Like if you go <laughs> quite far down some of the men's rights activist stuff, I mean, if you look at men going their own way, like this male separatist movement, it's quite interesting. It's quite small, but, you know, they make the point that the whole kind of game is rigged, right, in favour of women, which is the kind of red pill idea in the first place. But that, you know, they preemptively don't play the game. They're just saying, I'm not going to go on a date with women, right? I'm not going to spend money on these women. They're just going to use me. Right. I, I exempt myself, like I refuse to even begin, um, you know, and I, that's one option. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think like female strategies. Um, I mean, I think women tend to need fewer of them in a way. Um, maybe that's sort of boring answer in a way, but I think there might be kind of feminine strategies going on, but I think maybe a lot of the time they're kind of behind even women's own backs. I, I do think the shit test though is real. I do think that women, if they're looking for a partner, they are kind of testing men um, for certain things that are, might be quite hard to articulate. Like it's not necessarily that women want to be with like the best looking man or the most alpha man. I think if they want a proper relationship, they will be looking for somebody who's like, you know, maybe um, will sign up to protect them, you know, against other men potentially, <laughs> like, it, but who's also kind of, I don't know, like maybe generous and kind and thoughtful and, you know, specific, right? Not necessarily the kind of, you know, I mean, women don't ultimately marry bad boys very often, you know, but I don't know, don't ask me. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Cool. So we're going to go back up to the top now. Um, I don't know, Alf, do you still want to ask your question about? Oh, yeah, this? we missed that long question before. Um, yeah, there's that question. There's one about dismissive attachment styles. Alf, do you want to ask one of your? One yeah, of your so a new question kind of came to mind um, without going into that. I was curious about how these different loves mix and if there's any patterns. But mm. based on what Peter brought up, another thread that's coming to mind is just building on the shadow sides and maybe this gets more into the gender stuff but the relationship between women and men and even different uh, social classes there seems to in the culture wars there seems to be a lot of shadow dynamics so we were just talking about shadow dynamics as it related to mother and father um, but I'm just wondering if you see anything else there that's driving that and I'm also thinking in the men, right, of say post feminists wanting, critiquing a lot of toxic masculinity. Yeah. Um, and I'm new to this space, but looking at uh, some depth psychology, and uh, we actually need a certain more mature masculinity. And a lot of what we have in patriarchy today is a form of uh, like boy psychology or non integrated, you know, psychic content. Um, so we don't actually need less masculinity. We need healthier, more wise masculinity on both sides and, and the feminine empathy as well. Um, so that might be not fitting in here to this love talk, but that's what's coming to mind based on the shadow stuff we just talked about. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look even to the 90s, you had things like Iron John, the Robert Bly book, which was a kind of um, early attempt to, or not, you know, attempt at that point to try to um, think about uh, precisely what you're saying, like a kind of healthier masculinity, not to dismiss masculinity too core, cool, which is often what happens today, where all masculinity is perceived to be toxic. Even in the American Psychological Association guidelines, they seem to imply that masculinity itself is negative, which is kind of ex extremely unhelpful. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I in the book that I've just finished, it's, you know, I try to Think about this idea of a kind of society without the father like what does it mean to actually live actually post in a post patriarchal world in some ways which is to say where everybody is kind of more or less competing like like that men and women are more like siblings like it's more like a culture of si horizontal culture of sibling rivalry rather than a kind of generational culture of like you know older wiser people men or women you know instructing younger people how to live, you know, that, that we, that consumer culture and, and this particular kind of society we live in actually doesn't really value those, you know, those things, those forms of kind of knowledge. Um, and, and in that sense, it's a very infantilized culture. 
like but that both men and women are kind of weirdly um infantilized um you know and that the youth is kind of revered in all these different ways but this is yeah i think as you say like um it, itself very negative you know it, it doesn't kind of um celebrate forms of wisdom or learning or you know that might come you know through age or through integration i mean i'm not a jungian and i'm not a kind of expert in the the you know the ways of seeing the world in that way um to to any great degree but it's i do think um yeah there there is not really a very healthy way at the moment of like men and women integrating their masculine and feminine sides i think this plays out really pathologically in certain ways um at the same time as kind of recognizing sexual difference you know it is real you know i don't it's not something that can be simply um waved away by economic development or we you know even if capitalism says we don't really care whether you're a man or a woman or employers say like it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman you know we can see this as an advance in some ways like the mass entry of women into the workforce you know as economic agents right is a, is a certain kind of freedom right but it's not a kind of total freedom it's freedom on the terms of this system you know and the, these kinds of games that we're all forced to play um, and it's yeah within this horizontal kind of bandwidth I think hmm is is this horizontal? I haven't read the books. I'm sorry, but the, is the horizontal bandwidth of uh, friendly competition? Do you think that's a optimal design or just a necessary function of capitalistic culture or narcissistic culture? And I'm kind of the the context there is I'm thinking of our loss of elders and rites of passage and all that storyline. And this might be the only way we go, but that doesn't mean it's the optimal one. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's a complicated situation. I, I mean, I think there's obviously lots of attacks on patriarchy. You know, patriarchy is something that's kind of constantly criticised. Um, often, where people don't really know what they're talking about, they say, you know, the implication is that men have certain forms of power or privilege um, that are often unacknowledged or that they wield in particular ways. Um, you know, and which doesn't obviously take into account anything like social class. I mean, men die vastly higher rates from things like drug use or interpersonal violence or um, um, suicide and so on, right? So it's not clear at what level we mean this kind of privilege. We, we could say, yeah, of course, a small group of men, you know, run the world <laughs> in a certain way, or, you know, the richest people in the world tend to be men, and historically this has been the case. But I, in practice, patriarchy... Um, doesn't you know really operate in any positive way when when we talk about patriarchs like in the bible the patriarch is also the one like um, um abraham who takes responsibility the patriarch is the father the patriarch is the one who's basically um not only um you know ruling but is also the person who takes on responsibility so it's a twofold thing so so to be in charge is not necessarily a positive thing if everybody wants to just play all the time and just not never take responsibility then who who on earth would want that job right so actually we sort of live in a, a post-patriarchal world in the sense that like to actually take responsibility for yourself let alone a family or other people is relatively rare and not particularly valued you know and that would go along with this kind of you know perhaps a dismissive attitude towards older people you know that, that the their experiences are not really integrated very well into a kind of culture that really fetishizes youth overwhelmingly you know there isn't that reverence of generation and and philosophers like bernard stiegler make this point you know very well you know that we've lost the generational transmission of of knowledge great thank you ralph and nina andy would you like to ask your question sure i have a couple things i'll try to make it quick because i know that um i want to let everybody else go so would it be helpful number one to um add some classifications to supplement those eight greek traits given the 21st century where we've got um things like I could say, I love the Stoa, I love ice cream, I love Bono, I love Jimi Hendrix, and um, separating those, and um, then how uh, these para-loving uh, social media relationships develop. Uh, 
And then number two um, is what are the limitations of love when there's an asymmetric perception of Fila? So let me give a quick example. So um, I have a love for Peter. It's not eros, it's not dutiful, it's not compelled, it's not obligatory, it's not unconditional, and it's not a stranger. Uh, but there's asymmetry because I've never met Peter, I've never talked to Peter. Yeah. So what is it <laughs> you mean? I mean, it would probably come under philia. I mean, I think, you know, brotherly love, it, it doesn't, you know, none of these forms of love necessarily um, imply um, symmetry. I think there's a kind of very strange conversation that's generally going on, not in what you're saying, but in the culture at large, which is to do with power relations, which again are awfully under, under you know, described. But the idea that if there's any power imbalance in a relationship, then it's a bad thing, you know. So often people get very upset about big age gaps um, in relationships or um, where one person is much richer than another and so on. But I think this is partly because we haven't really thought enough about what power is. And again, the Baudrillard is really helpful here because, you know, there are, very, there are many different kinds of power, right? To be young and beautiful is a, is a massive power, right? It's, you know, it's a different kind of power than to be older and wealthier, right? But those two things might be, um, they're different and they might be asymmetrical, but they might be kind of um, interestingly compatible in some ways. Do you see what I mean? Like it doesn't, you don't have to admire or love someone in exactly the same way as they love and admire you. And, you know, that I think there's nothing wrong with asymmetry in, in love in, in any kind of relationship necessarily you know that's a different point from a you know an abusive relationship right i think there is a there's obviously a strict difference between those those two but even then you know we have a culture in which um you know to to call someone an abuser is a very easy option you know and and sometimes i think like me too allowed for a lot of people to retroactively condition previous relationship and re-describe them as abusive whereas they may have just been like bad relationships you know where both people like behaved badly or both people were not right for each other so I think you know the words we use are very important but I think with all those kinds of love they don't need to be um you know it doesn't matter if they're not like perfectly symmetrical I think it's it's almost impossible to to know actually if you're in an equal relationship there's no way of measuring it you know if two people agree to be together let's say in a, a normal two-person relationship and both of you say we want similar things right let's hang out together and do these things and do you want kids yes or no we both agree great you know so you both have the same project more or less and that's the pragma um, you still never really be able to know um, or whether it's even a good question to ask whether one person loves the other more than the other. <laughs> You'll never know, right? It might play out in, in how you behave, but it's, I think to, to want that kind of equality um, or symmetry is like a, is a political desire actually that's being carried over into a realm which shouldn't necessarily be politicized in that way. You know, I think the politicization of everything um, is a bad idea when it comes to to love. I mean, like all's fair in love and war, in a way, you know, <laughs> or all's unfair, perhaps. Um, Great. Any follow up, Andy? Are you good? Okay, excellent. Um, let me see here. What else? Marion's been like on fire in the chat. Let me see if there's any other like true questions before putting her on the spot. Um, oh, there's a question from Adam. What makes love stay? Adam, do you want to flush out your question? Yeah. yeah, I'll flush that out a little bit. Thank you so much, Raven. Thank yeah. you, Nina. It's been really wonderful so far. So I was thinking about these different modalities and I guess my question is a bit about trajectories and do you see any interesting trends over time in in these modalities as far as what makes these different types of love come and what makes them stay what forces them away uh are they are they destined to be fleeting a lot of these things or can they be a constant in certain modalities do some follow the tides in and out just 
anything you find interesting in there, or you can take it behind the shed and force feed it a bullet. Right. <laughs> No, uh, I think I think well. What comes to mind when you're saying asking that is, is is the broader culture. It's like what gets valued in the broader culture, right? It's like these. It's it's like if we've lost something like the idea of civic friendship. You know, the idea that you love the city and therefore you love everyone in the city and therefore you look after them because you're also looking after the city and you know you're all part of a whole in a certain way. Um, if, if all of these things are kind of very individualized and they have no broader context. So let's say we live in a culture that um, seems to push certain forms of relationships. Let's say temporary fleeting sexual relationships that the algorithm has decided you should have. Um, then that's in a way what gets valued. Whereas if you live in a society that kind of says, you know, marriage is wonderful and it's the most secure place for people to be. And, you know, then that's what gets valued. And, you know, I think that kind of, we could say like a liberal um, emphasis on uh, freedom, right? A certain kind of freedom for individuals to make up their own mind. We could say, that's great. People are no longer socially punished for living in particular different arrangements. Um, wonderful. We're all very accepting of everybody's different diverse desires and, and modes of living and relations. Um, but that doesn't kind of give you much of an indication of what might be valued in a broader and ongoing sense, which I, I think is your question about the trends. You know, what, how can we sort of say in a way what kind of um, lasts and what doesn't, you know? Um, yes, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think we are in a particular period in which very fleeting relations are privileged as if they were kind of more like um, buying takeaway. Um, than things that have a longevity like loyalty and friendship you know I think words like loyalty have a very bad rap these days right I think that these words are often associated with like the right wing or traditionalist modes of thinking and therefore they must be bad because if the right likes them then they're they're bad but actually um, those values if you actually sort of think about and reflect on them you know you, you need to criticize them at the level of their actual meaning, not just because someone you don't like thinks they're a good thing. You know, and I, I do think things like loyalty have been seriously eroded as concepts, you know, that we can just dispense with everyone the moment we're annoyed with them for five minutes. And I think this is a bad development. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. That was a great, you've made me really crave some like Shell Frazee and maybe some Pashwari Nan though. So I'm a little, little annoyed at that, but the rest of it was perfect, thank you. Right, I like the synesthetic philosophy that generates odd desires, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Great, and I think uh, we're gonna, so Marion, yeah, if you wanna ask your question. I would love to ask you a question. It's, first of all, um, Mir, thank you. This has been, there's so many light bulbs going off in my head during this session and Raven and it's just been delightful. Um, and I think what I'm about to ask tags on to our last, the last thing you were saying. I find that it can be very tempting as, as you pointed out, women in dating have an early advantage in relationships. It's very easy to just move to the next person, replace, replace, replace. And I find, and I'm going to get vulnerable and personal here, I find it can be very tempting to try to compensate for a fear of later abandonment by viewing potential suitors as commodities, as very replaceable. They don't like it, but it's very tempting. And so I'm wondering if you have any insights in your research and personal experience and your philosophy about ways of engaging in, in love and specifically in eros and in romance, which are not so much reactions to um, fear of abandonment or to replacing the past or to trying to find power through attachment. Um, I hope that's clear. I hope it's useful to some other people as well. I, could really use your insight on this. Yeah, I mean, I think um, from the, you know, the ancient philosophical point of view, in a way, 
all of these different kinds of love are um, kind of important. I, I think, you know, there's a way in which like the love of knowledge, if we want to take even the word philosophy seriously, you know, that love of wisdom, literally, um, that kind of points to, you know, different um, ways of being in the world that aren't kind of tied up in the first place with another human being. And I think the idea of like fill out here as well, like care of the self, we could expand it, you know, not just love, not just love of the self. And it's not a negative term for the Greeks, right? It's not narcissism. It's caring for oneself, you know, is also would be caring for oneself, you know, as a loved person. You know, I think when people sort of um, think of themselves very negatively or treat themselves very badly and you say you wouldn't treat someone else like that. Like, why are you treating yourself like that? You're also a person. You know, this idea that, you know, that actually one um, can and should value one's own self but simply by virtue of being a human in the world like everybody else. You know, and it, and, it, and it doesn't make sense from a moral point of view if you are trying to be good and kind to other people, if you're not also applying that rule to yourself in the first place. And I think there's a way in which, you know, when people are kind of self-sufficient or seemingly very engaged in the world and very engaged in their own kind of projects and, and knowledge and so on, um, you know, that they can live without someone else. Like to not need somebody else for whatever reason you know, is very different from then wanting to be with somebody because you like them, you know, to actually make an active choice about being with someone because you enjoy spending time with them and they enjoy spending time with you um, is very different, obviously, from feeling like a lack that needs to be kind of filled by somebody else. And I and so I wonder about, you know, I mean, I had this great sort of revelation about nature a few years ago where I kind of um, someone mentioned the sun earlier in the comments. Yeah, the, where it's just like this kind of overwhelming love of nature, you know, and this kind of way of being in the world that was kind of very, very um, sort of beautiful all the time. And it wasn't almost like a agape, you know, feeling towards the universe as whole. And, and it's not it's not that I don't rationally understand that nature is kind of violent and vicious and indifferent. It doesn't really give a shit about me or anyone else and that we've mostly destroyed it through various kind of forms of human rapacious behavior. But right? it's not that I don't rationally understand all those things, but I think there's a way of having a kind of experience of being in the world of which where one can feel more or less um, self-sufficient, you know, and kind of um, at peace with where one is in the present moment, right? So that there is a kind of lack of a need for, um, you know, other, other people almost, you know, obviously that can become very ascetic and, and isolationist and closed off. And some people are more like that, you know, some people are extremely self-sufficient, um, you know, that they don't need anyone else. But I think there's a kind of, you know, a sort of beautiful blurry place between being able to kind of, um, I don't know, just, be with people because you want to be so an active desire and being okay with being on your own um but i think this is one of the great um i don't know complexities really of human life you know of human relations you know and, and to find someone that is both tolerant and tolerable <laughs> is perhaps like very difficult <laughs> for any great length of time uh so I, th I think probably, yeah, it's, it's probably good to um, be able to be on your own for long periods of time, if necessary. <laughs> That's my experience anyway. I love, and I not mean it like, I love that you brought it back to um, the desire or the idea of becoming uh, perfectly independent, because I think it can be, I know for myself, it can often be, um, a way of fleeing attachment or fleeing um, risk of abandonment is to become more interested in love of self, love of nature, love of work, love of philosophy, love of anything other than a beloved person. Mm. And you kind of touched on this in the, the blurry region, but it seems like such a tender, delicate, and elusive balance to have love of a beloved person while also having it as you I think you referred to this as a positive love not as a replacement for absence but as a reaching out from a place of 
um, sufficiency. That's mm -hmm. like the map. So I think I really like the way you refer to it with this kind of blurry space of having the map, but then also being able to reach out from there. So thank you for that. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, we're going to wrap everything up. Nina, do you have any final words, images, thoughts, symbols? <laughs> um, no, not really. But I, I think this has been really interesting. And I, I, it's, it's quite um, important for me, I think, quite interesting for me to have these different levels of response, actually, that we, we started talking um, not just conceptually and philosophically, but also, I don't know, more interpersonally and, and more kind of almost psychoanalytically or therapeutically. Um, this, you know, this is very interesting for me. I mean, I mean I'm also in analysis, you know, I do a Lacanian analysis like every, every week, so for three and a half years. Um, so it's something I might kind of um, think about a little bit more, the analytic dimension in the next few weeks. Um, and I'm very happy to for people to to approach any of these topics in any of the ways. Basically, I'm just saying I'm quite open to it. So, um, yeah, next week is on marriage. Um, so I think maybe what I'll do is at the beginning of next week, kind of um, maybe just go through almost partly for amusement's sake some of the things that philosophers have said about marriage, um, just as a starting point. And then, you know, it, it'd be very good if people could come a little bit with their um just their own feelings about it really positive or negative or a mixture of both um you know because i find this topic very interesting and curious and i and i i mean as as everyone does i think and i'm very interested in those kind of cultural shifts that seem to have happened like between my parents generation you know like i mentioned you know they're kind of classic baby boomers you know post-war children got married at 23 they've been together for 50 years you know they have this very like work hard play hard you know pragmatic love relationship and it's really you know you have to say it's a very successful model right for them at least but they're not alone you know a lot of their friends are in similar um you know categories so I'm kind of quite interested in them not well I mentioned them personally they're my parents but you know but <laughs> I'm also interested in them as representatives of a generational cultural um model which had its advantages and disadvantages compared to the shifts that have happened in marriage or the turn away from marriage in large part that have happened in generations, including mine afterwards. So I think that's broadly what I'll talk about next week. So it, you know, anything that's, that's relevant or interesting that people want to talk about that relates to that, I'm totally open for it. And um, yeah, no, thanks for everyone. I like the, uh, everyone's very well-mannered and it's very respectful. <laughs> And that's really, it's very nice. Wonderful. Thank you, Nina. It's been excellent. And thank you, everybody, for being here and asking such amazing questions. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the series. I think we're really going to dig into some great stuff. And with that, I'll hand it over to Peter to close us out. All right. Thank you, Raven. And yes, Nina, we're a bunch of well-mannered weirdos here at the STOA. Now you're going to get all these questions from all these different angles. Uh, and what, what I really like about the series and I like about you is that you're so knowledgeable on all these obscure masculinist scenes like uh, MGTOW, Rouge V, Iron John. I'm like, wow, my God, I can geek out finally with someone about this. I did write a book about it. I had to do some research, come on. <laughs> right, right. Um, so uh, some related events coming up at the STOA, uh, we have uh, Settler Sexualities with uh, Kim Talbear. Uh, that's at 8 p.m. Eastern time tonight. And Kim's coming in to talk about how kind of like Western monogamous norms have been imposed on uh, Native Americans. Um, and then uh, November 16th at 12 p.m. Eastern time, we have uh, this new series called Stoic uh, Provocations, where we have someone come in, present some edgy thoughts, we turn off the recording, and then we get in a collective dialogue together. And that's on sex positivity and OnlyFans. So that should be uh, pretty dope. And we also have this, uh, there's this film, uh, kind of incel film, uh, it's called uh, uh, That Feel When, No Girlfriend. Uh, so we're going to have a screening and a Q&A with uh, the director, uh, Alex Lee Moyer, and that's December 5th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So this, this uh, series is going to definitely prime us for that. So that being said, uh, Nina, Raven, everyone, thank you for coming to the store today.